Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Thursdays 13 and we are going to cover 13 things. On, well, we, more like Raj, is going to cover 13 things on his list. Of course, that is very loud. And then, of course, we have our normal news stories like about Russia and the EU and weather and all sorts of stuff going on in the world, or at least in the Western world. Let's go ahead and go into our headlines. Today on Before Coffee. EU approves 14th Russian sanction package, including first ever LNG sector measure. And hurricane season is here as Alberto slams into Mexico and Texas. And we have our hot summer reports. South Korea blast Russia-North Korea deal says it will consider supplying arms to Ukraine. In our Thursday 13, we look at voter participation and or suppression in the United States. The Pushing Buttons newsletter. The disrupting online misogyny of Gamergate have returned, if it ever went away. All right, splotchy internet aside, welcome to Before Coffee on June 20th. Oh, why is that audio playing? That's not the audio that should be playing. <laughs> All right, let's start with our first news story coming off of Euro... 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 CTIV. I'm not exactly sure how you're supposed to say that by Alexandra Brozowski. EU member states on Thursday, June 20th, which is today, approved a 14th package of sanctions against Russia over its war in Ukraine, which for the first time included a ban on re-exports of Russian liquefied natural gas, or LNG, in the EU. Re-export, so you're not allowed to sell the Russian gas for your own profits. This package provides a new target measure and maximizes the impact of existing sanctions by closing loopholes, the Belgian EU presidency said about the agreement, which came after member states had debated the new measures for over a month. This hard-hitting patch will further deny Russia's access to key technologies, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said. It will strip Russia of further energy revenues and tackle Putin Putin's shadow fleet and shadow banking network abroad, she said. European ports in Belgium and France and the Netherlands and Spain are currently the main entry points for LNG deliveries from Russian Siberian Yamal Peninsula, with some of them being key hubs for re-exports to countries such as Turkey, China, and further Southeast Asia. While Hungary had threatened to veto the package on principle over its general opposition to Russian energy sanctions, Germany was the last holdout over the inclusion of the so-called No Russia Clause, which is feared would hurt their businesses. Well, maybe Russia shouldn't be an asshole. One of the impacted companies would be the Securing Energy for Europe, GB, GmbH, S-E-F-E, -E, registered in Germany, which was formerly Gazprom Germania. It acts as a conglomerate for 40 entities operating in more than 20 countries in Europe, Asia, and North America. It requires Yamal LNG volumes transshipped in Zeebrugge to serve its long-term contract with India's Gale LTD and other buyers. Well, maybe you should tell Russia to stop being in a war. The company said it is monitoring the developments and declined to comment in detail on the potential impact of the sanctions package. I mean, if it's affecting India, which India has not been exactly against Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That sounds like a positive for me. Eventually, Thursday's agreed text watered down an initial European Commission proposal by the dropping the measure that would have forced subsidiaries of EU companies in third countries to which contradict contractually prohibit the re-exports of their goods to Russia. The new restriction under the package will not hit the majority of Russians' liquid natural gas LNG exports to the EU. However, the ban on trans shipments in the first restrictions the bloc has applied to LNG, a first ever far-reaching measure that would have seemed unthinkable in terms of reaching unanimity at the EU level. Now, ports in the EU will not be allowed to resell Russian LNG and financing for Russia's planned Arctic and Baltic LNG terminals will be blocked. However, some experts in the gas market have questioned whether the measures will have any 
tangible impact on Europe is still purchasing Russian gas. Meanwhile, trans -ship shipments from EU ports to Asia equate to just 10% of all of Russia's LNG exports. With Germany having asked for an impact assessment, many EU diplomats are hopeful that the initial proposal could potentially be reintroduced, sorry, re-included in a future sanctions package proposal negotiations. Germany was fearful of some clauses hurting their industry. Well, aren't we all. But there is a limit to that if we have a common objective. And thankfully, they didn't want to end up the next hungry, one EU diplomat speaking on the condition of anonymity said. There is room for more in the long term, a second EU diplomat said. So, they haven't completely banned buying LNG, but they at least can't re-export it, I guess. Which, selling it to other countries, like third world countries. And... Let's see if that will do any give any pressure to Russia in their continued long war that they've started against Ukraine. It's going to Kim Jong Un for their for their yeah. It's kind of pathetic. Yes, <laughs> it's a fourth world country. It is. They have no yeah. economy. Basically, just a military junta running thing. Kim Jong-un is a dictator, not allowed to even criticize him. Yeah, let's go to them for help. Let's be beholding <laughs> to them. Yeah. All right, so is that the story? Is it my turn? Yep, that's it. Is it my situation? Screw Russia. I mean, not Russia themselves, just the leaders. I say the same about Israel. Screw their leadership. Screw leaders. Moscow. Thugs. <laughs> Screw the Kremlin, let's say that. All right. Uh, unless there is good people in a Kremlin, I'm sure just trying to work through the stupidity of it all. We'll see at some point. And the U.S. knows the weather takes the headlines as the hurricane season started and we named a tropical storm Alberto. This is from uh, cbsnews.com. Tropical storm Alberto moved playing for several death and deaths in Mexico's Gulf Coast. Tropical Storm Alberto was near northeast Mexico early Thursday, carrying heavy rains that left at least three people dead, but also brought hope to the region suffering under a prolonged severe drought is the first named storm of the season. Alberto is expected to get to Mexico's Gulf Coast shortly, raking over land to dissipate later on Thursday night. According to the National Hurricane Miami, because I mean, the extending so cold is up to the south of those earth. Hey, rainfall and gusty winds were starting for the Texas coast, but were forecast to continue through the morning in northeast Mexico with the hurricane. At 5 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the center of Alberta was approximately 40 miles east of Tampico, Mexico and 250 miles south of Brownsville, Texas, and was moving west at 50 miles per hour with sustained maximum winds of 50 miles per hour. Not quite a hurricane, but a lot of rain and some rain. Oh, it starts to cross southern Texas today. The interpreter is expected to center that there could be a tornado or two across the south of Texas. Heavy rains expect to continue through northeast Mexico through the morning with 5 to 10 inches more anticipated. Maximum totals of about 20 inches are possible across the higher terrain of the Mexican states of Coahuila, Nuevo León, and Tamaulipas. 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 Can't pronounce it. That will likely produce considerable and flooding only in renewed. River flooding. Mudslides are also possible in areas of higher terrain across northeast Mexico, the center said. Much of Mexico has been suffering under severe drought conditions, with northern Mexico especially hard hit. Cuyaraga noted the state's reservoirs were low, and Mexico owed the United States a massive water debt in their shared use of the Rio Grande. This is a win win event in Tamaulipas, but then the nearby Nuevo Leon state, civil protection authorities reopened three, reported three deaths linked to the Alberto rains. They said one man died in the Lia Sila River from the, in the city of Monterrey, the state capital, and the two miners died from electric shock. 
the mist. Local media heard the man riding a bicycle in the rain. Oh. Other weather, other weather news. Um, U.S. heat wave leaves 100 million record uh, under heat alerts across the eastern United States. This is from a Axios. Rebecca Falconer, Andrew Friedman. It's a short story. Officials in several states have activated emergency operations and opened cooling centers in response to the lingering heat dome that left over 100 million people under heat alerts Thursday morning. And an intensified heat wave that's striking the Midwest and the Northeast has seen multiple new maximum temperature records set or tied this week with more to come. New York Governor Ethical has made emergency operations that are in through Friday for parts of the stack of Dome and made us here Michelle Wu declared a heat emergency that's effective through Thursday. Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont's extreme hot weather protocol remain effective through 12 noon Sunday. Southern New England saw multiple daily temperatures set, including Boston, which hit 98 degrees Fahrenheit on Wednesday. The National Weather Service noted Wednesday several main cities were tied for the hottest June 19th. Caribou, Caribou tradition the coldest in a winter which reached 96 degrees some hottest for also big huge hot day forecast Washington DC shows high temperature for our water sun today the last time that city hit 100 degrees was 2016. So it's going to be a hot weekend here. From roughly DC side, the heat wave will not end this week in the 90s. Fahrenheit like through all next as well. A record strong heat dome is more cast to slide southward and sprawl out, covering much of southeast to mid Atlantic and through early night. At the same time, a heat wave is expected to expand. And another heat related. <laughs> Story. Saudi Arabia says, you, th you got hot temperatures? Well, hold my beer. Hold my beer. <laughs> oh, my beer. They, don't, they don't drink in Saudi Arabia. It's got like the uncrest. It's not a story. It's not a story. It's not a story. Saudi Arabia officials say. Hundreds of people died during the year's high images about it. It has a faithful face, intense high temperatures, and on a cold site in the desert kingdom, officials said Wednesday as people blame their loved ones' bodies. Saudi Arabia has not commented on death toll them eight during the Pugrid Major required of every eight Muslim once once in their life. Already caused to tell you what caused it is it really just sell it caused it. However, hundreds of people had lined up in the emergency complex of Al Museum neighborhood about their missing family members. One list circulating suggests 550 people died during a five day Hajj, H A J J. So it's spelled Hajj. I don't know what, any other way to pronounce it. <laughs> a medic who spoke to the Associated Press. And an entity to discuss information not released publicly by the government said that the names listed appear genuine. That men and other officials who spoke in a condition of anonymity said they believed at least 600 odd beings were at the facility. Are not uncommon at the Hodge, which had run at times over 2 million people in Saudi Arabia. They have there have been stampedes and epidemics throughout the pilgrimage history. Each year, the Hodge draws hundreds of thousands of pilgrims from low income nations, many of whom have have had little if a pre Hodge healthcare. An article in the April of infection upset. Communicable diseases can spread among the gathered masses. Many paralyzed the tr their trips and can be elderly pre existing health conditions that they spread it. However, this can cause the number of deaths. Well, already, several countries have said some of their pilgrims died because of the heat that swept across all these sites and we got including Jordan and Tunisia. Temperatures on Thursday reached 107 degrees Fahrenheit in Mecca, 
and the sacred sites in and around the city, according to the Saudi National Center for Meteorology. Onlookers saw some people faint while trying to perform the symbolic stoning of the devil. I mean, the devil's just sitting there laughing while people burn to death in the heat. You know, there was Maybe. a devil. He's sitting there going, "Yeah, <laughs> look at you! It's 125, and you're standing there throwing rocks." At the at the Grand Mosque in Mecca, temperatures reached 125 degrees Fahrenheit on Monday. I don't know if you can even breathe in that temperature. Though pilgrims had are left already left for me, now authorities said. Well, it's good they were around for the bad stuff, huh? Others, including many citizens, lost track of their loved ones in the crowds. More than 1.8 million, 1.83 million Muslims in Hajj in 2024, including more than two countries and around 1,000 Saudi citizens to residents, according to the Saudi. I want. Maybe they should just tell us the big herd of old people. Maybe that's what I would do, right? Not maybe. That's all it is. It's killing you. That's all it's doing, man. What a... On Wednesday, the medical complex in Mecca, an Egyptian man collapsed on the ground when he heard the name of his mother among the dead. He cried for some time before grabbing his cell phone and calling a travel agent, shouting, He left her to die! The crowd tried to calm the man. Security... Here tied at the complex with officials, the names of the dead, the nationalities, which included people from Algeria, Egypt, and India. Those who said they were a kin of the dead were allowed inside to identify the deceased. Well, there you go. Hundreds dead in a religious ritual that me, just this silly human here on earth, not pretending to know anything I don't know, I sure as hell don't understand that, and I never will. No matter how long I live, I will never understand people marching through deaths in the desert or an invisible man. Back to you. Okay. Well, I hope those people rest in peace and they get their closure and because that's awful to die in from heat stroke. It's not a great way to go. Either way. I think you're instantly fine, though. Dehydrated yeah. or like, mummified, is you know, at least, right? You just lay there long enough, all that moisture's coming out of your body. Preserved well, anyway, mm -hmm. right? I guess. Silver lining on the awful, horrible dying of, you know, chemical imbalance in the your awful, body, horrible, having no yeah. water. Yeah. All right. Maybe they hallucinated at the end. I don't know. I think your when you're about to die, your body does uh, kind of put you in a hallucination but Probably. enough about that strad sad and tragic news let's talk about more russia stuff because that's what i'm talking about today this is from kim tong kyung on ap south korea has blasted russia's north korea deal and they may offer their own weapons to ukraine coming out of seoul south korea on thursday condemned an agreement reached by russia and north korea that pledged mutual defense assistance in an event of a war and said it will consider its policy of limiting its support to Ukraine to non-lethal supplies. The comments by a senior presidential official came hours after North Korea's state media released the details of the agreement reached between its leaders Kim Jong-un and Russian President Vladimir Putin during the summit on Wednesday in Pyongyang. The North official, which Wednesday was the 19th and today is the 20th, North Korea's official Korean news agency said the deal requires both countries to use all available means to provide immediate military assistance in the event of a war. The office of South Korean President Yoon suk yeol issued a statement condemning the agreement, calling it a threat to the South's security and a violation of the UN Security Council's resolution, and warned that it would have negative consequences on Seoul's relation with Moscow. The presidential official who spoke on condition of anonymity during a background briefing according to the office rules said in seoul said seoul in response will can reconsider the issues of providing arms to ukraine to help the country fight off russia's invasion south korea a growing arms exporter with a well-equipped military backed by the united states has provided humanitarian aid and other support to ukraine while joining the u.s-led economic sanctions against moscow but it has not directly provided arms to Ukraine, citing a long-standing policy of not supplying weapons to countries actively engaged in conflict. 
Both Kim and Putin described their deal as a major upgrade of the bilateral relations covering security, trade, investment, cultural, and humanitarian ties. Outside observers said it could mark the strongest connection between Moscow and Pyongyang since the end of the Cold War. KCNA said Article 4 of the agreement states that if one of the countries gets invaded and is pushed into a state of war, other must deploy all means at its disposal without delay to provide military and other assistance, but also says that such actions must be in accordance with the laws of both countries. In Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, which recognizes a UN member state's right to self-defense, it observed that the two parties, with a history of launching wars of invasion, the Korean War and the war in Ukraine, are now vowing mutual military cooperation on the premise of a preemptive attack by international community that will never happen. Yoon's office said. Yeah, like, hey guys, let's go attack North Korea so that we can, I mean, I can see an idea where that could happen, right? If you want Russia to be fighting a war on two fronts, now that they're in this, you know, you attack North Korea, oh, well, Russia, you said you're going to help us if we get attacked, you know, and then Russia has to split its forces because it has to help Korea. Like, it could work, but I just don't see anybody actually wanting to do that. Like, yeah, let's invade North Korea, finally! In particular, Russia's decision to support North Korea and cause harm to our security despite its status as permanent member of the Security Council that has endorsed the sanction resolution against North Korea will inevitably have an impact on South Korea-Russia relations. The summit between Kim and Putin came as the US and its allies expressed growing concern over a possible arms arrangement in which Pyongyang provides Moscow with badly needed munitions for its war in Ukraine in exchange for economic assistance technology trampers that could enhance a threat the economic economic oh sorry enhance the threat posed by Kim's nuclear weapons and missile program following the summit Kim said that the two countries had a fiery friendship and that the deal was their strongest ever treaty putting the relationship at the level of an alliance he vowed full support for Russia's war in Ukraine. Putin called it a breakthrough document reflecting shared desires to move relations to a higher level. North Korea and the former Soviet Union signed a treaty in 1961, which experts say necessitated, necessitated Moscow's military intervention in the North. When the North, sorry, experts say necessitated Moscow's military intervention if the North came under attack. Necessitated. The deal was discarded after the collapse of the USSR, replaced by one in 2000 that offered weaker security assurances. So this is a return back to that 1961 agreement. Their ongoing debate on how strong of a security commitment Russia has made to North Korea, including whether the agreement obligates Moscow to interview, intervene military in a war involving the North, while some analysts see the agreement as a full restoration of the country's Cold War Air Alliance. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. I would say the deal seems more symbolic than substantial. Well, yeah, it's symbolic because when is North Korea ever going to get invaded and attacked? Nobody wants to touch them. They're like, they're like a disease, you know. Oh, don't touch to go near them. Nobody wants to touch North Korea. Anik Panda, a senior analyst at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, said Article 4 appeared to be carefully worded as to not imply automatic military intervention. But... The big picture here is that both sides are willing to put down on paper and show the world just how widely they intend to expand the scope of their cooperation, he said. The deal was made as Putin visited North Korea for the first time in 24 years, a visit that showcased their personal and geopolitical ties with Kim hugging Putin twice at the airport, their motorcycle rolling past giant Russian flags and Putin portraits in a welcoming ceremony at Pyongyang's main square attended by what appeared to be tens of thousands of spectators that were probably forced to be there it's north korea after all according to kcna the agreement also states that pyongyang and moscow must not enter into agreements with third parties if they infringe on the core interests of another they must not participate in actions that threaten those interests KCNA said the agreement requires the countries to take steps to prepare joint measures for the purpose of strict nuclear defense capabilities to prevent war and protect regional and global peace and security. The agency didn't specify what those steps are, or they would include combined military training and other cooperation. 
The agreement also calls for countries to actively cooperate in efforts to establish and just a just multipolar new world order. Why do people have to say that word? Let's make a new world order. Okay, good luck. KCNA said, according to scoring, the countries are lying in face of their separate escalating confrontations with the United States. How Russia's treaty with New North Korea affects its relations with South is key development to watch, said Jenny Town, a senior fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington and director of the North Korea Focus 38 North website. Seoul has already signed onto sanctions against Russia for its invasion of Ukraine, sour its relationship with Moscow. Now, with any ambiguity of Russia's partnership with North Korea removed, how will Seoul respond? She said. Is there a point where it decides to cut or suspend diplomatic ties with Russia or expel its ambassador? And have we reached, reached it? Kim, in recent months, has made Russia its priority as he's pushing a foreign policy aimed at expanding his relations with countries confronting Washington, raising the idea of a new Cold War, trying to display a united front in Putin's broader conflicts with the West. Tensions on the Korean Peninsula are the highest point in years, with the pace of both Kim's weapons tests and combined military exercises involving the US, South Korea, and Japan intensifying it tit for tat cycle. The Koreas have also engaged in Cold War style psychological warfare that involved North Korea dropping tons of trash on South with balloons and the South broadcasting anti North Korean propaganda with its loudspeakers. Yeah, we did the article on the uh, trash dump. I think you did that article. Just. <laughs> Here's some trash! Haha! We showed them! We dropped some trash on them. Yeah. Congratulations, you have a lot of trash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they, up in the they east. knocked off the trash flights, I think. Yeah. Well, that's my story. It is? Okay, yep. I gotta send you a link here. Hold on a second. Delay, delay, delay while I send you a link. Hold on. Those are really dumb. Da, 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 da. Time for the 13, 13 things. Thursdays, 13 things that are... Time for the... Thursday or uh, uh, <laughs> want to start that about video. Anyway, there you go. Thank you. I got it. Thursday thirteen, which I say two words that are the same. Apparently, Thursday thirteen, we have an election this year, a presidential election, and we're going to look at the lowest voter turnout in the last presidential election and i think we can probably identify the reasons but we'll delve into it uh we're gonna rank these by the lowest to the 13th lowest and uh it does include washington dc which is kind of unfair since they do not get to elect a senator or any representatives so they only get presidential uh electoral votes they get three of them yeah which is silly but anyway uh, so their lo their voter turnout is in this list, so I think it's unfair to can they don't have the same rules as states. Let's say they're a territory. So we had to include North Dakota on the list, to replace <laughs> D.C. Okay. <laughs> so the lowest the voter turnout oh, of this is percentage of voters that of voters who actually could vote. When I say 100% of voters who could vote voted. This is the percentage who actually vote of people who vote, who could vote, not of registered voters, just to make clear. So Oklahoma, only about 55% of the people will vote at their lowest in 2020. Yeah. And we live there for a while. Uh, I, think the, I think the main reason, well, one of the main reasons is voter suppression. It's really hard to vote there. They, put, they make ballot uh, boxes highly inaccessible. And of course, the Native American population in Oklahoma, they don't vote at a very high rate of Native Americans. They vote at a very low rate. And uh, I don't know if it courts their votes. But uh, yeah, that's one of the reasons Oklahoma's got low. Next at number 50 is Arkansas. Arkansas is one of those places with a high black population and low black voter turnout. And I think that's the reason for a lot of the low voter turnout is suppression, voter suppression. Not yeah. that the voters, not that the voters don't want to vote. It's just that they don't ever see anything change. So why vote? 
That's one of your number one voter suppression techniques is to let people know that their vote don't mean a damn thing. Stay mm -hmm. home. We'll take care of it for you. Hawaii comes in as a third. Now, Hawaii, you can understand in presidential elections, they're really not up in the air. No presidential election yet has come up to, oh my God, Hawaii is going to decide it. Well, they're not necessarily a swing state. So unless there's a really close governor election or a really close Senate election, they're going to have low voter participation. And of course, their native population is also very high, but they're not suppressed like other states. They're just uh, pathetic, I would think. Apathy is probably the number one reason there. West Virginia has a numerous problems. One of its mountainous terrain is not easy to get around. Another is poverty. Another is voter registration and vooter ID laws. If coming to uh, what help, percent apply are they? To people. Sorry, there's voter like a ID reflection laws. on the whiteboard, so I can't see it very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you see it? I don't have No, numbers. I don't see the it's percent, West though. Virginia. Oh, you see it still? You see it now? Yeah, but I don't see the percent. It's empty. Oh, I didn't write it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was only writing the percentages to give a reference. I'm not oh, really okay. writing them for everyone because they, they're kind of all the same. They're kind of all like, oh, 50-ish. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 60. A little over 60. It never little gets over above 50. Oh, okay. It never gets above 64, but yeah, you're okay. not going to see the percentages after that. Sorry that I got lazy because it seemed kind of, um, <laughs> I don't know, pedantic or just totally anal to be writing all these percentages. You know, just out, oh, it, you get the general idea that a little over half of the people who can vote are voting. That's not enough. If you go to the bottom of this list, or so you want to call the top of this list, it's Minnesota, and they're around 80%. So, yeah. Way to go, Minnesota. Minnesota wants you to vote. Don't restrict you from voting. They encourage you to vote. The next one on the list is West Virginia. Again, uh, um, I was always saying poll taxes. Voter ID are just another form of poll tax because they're making you go out and physically spend money to get an ID, a picture of you on it. And what's the big deal about voting? You're a person. You're obviously over 18. If you don't think they're a uh, resident, Take a provisional ballot. You can check it later. You don't have to count it in the initial count. It's a very simple process. If they're not a real voter, you throw out their ballot. If you don't, if they are, if they check out, you count it. Really ain't that hard. But they've just made it hard to So West Virginia is one of those states, has a lot of things going against voter participation, and then on top of it, they make it hard. Tennessee, another place where voter participation is low, Again, if you look at the statistics, it's the black vote is being suppressed. And this is going to be a theme of the South, which is why we bring Mississippi into the equation. Mississippi's around 60%. They're our first state to jump into the 60% range. Mississippi! <laughs> These are red states. These are all red states. I see a track. Is Hawaii, Hawaii turnout, is not a red state? Hawaii turnout equals Republicans yeah, yeah, get elected. Texas, another red state. Texas, yep. another state that really suppresses them. And, and they it's big suppress too. the African American vote. They suppress the they suppress the Hispanic vote. They really suppress the Hispanic vote. Because they have so, and because New they have Mexico, such a large population, right? Sixty yep. percent of Texas's population is a lot of people who aren't voting, right? Oh, and Texas has one of the most diverse populations in the country. And New mm -hmm. Mexico on the list is a nominal blue state, but a, uh, one of the states with the highest Native American populations. Again, Native Americans, very low voter turnout in this entire country, for that matter. Well, the problem is they don't, so they're not, they don't, a, a lot of them don't feel like part of the country, right? People don't even think they exist. Mm -hmm. There's many white Americans who are like, you guys still exist? Like, they seriously believe we eradicated all the natives out of the country. So. Right. Well, we can't account for ignorance, but we probably should. Um, our And our first northern state, Indiana, surprises the Reds. And again, they're passing even more voter restrictions. Of course, the biggest these in Indiana, blue. So... I just think 
push for voter registration, a uh, voter prayer. Yeah. And for the next one on our list, which is 42 on the state's list of participation, no to the south with Alabama. We have the same issue with Mississippi, same states, voter suppression. New York has no wow, excuse really? oh. for uh, low voter turnout. And, uh, uh, I have no idea why. Apathy, laziness, but New York has absolutely no excuse <laughs> for low voter turnout. Get your shit together. DC, you can understand. They're not really a state. Probably shouldn't belong in this list, but uh, they do have traditionally low voter turnout. Uh, they don't ever feel like they're being represented in any way. So mm -hmm. I can understand DC, which is why we had to add North Dakota to the list as the 13th state. The whole state of Louisiana, which recently, a couple of days ago, decided that they want the commandments on their walls in their public school, which is totally unconstitutional. The Ten Commandments favors one religion, and it's not even Christianity. It's Old Testament, uh, you know. Judaism. And, yeah, when you're backwards, face, they are the bottom. Of course, then we have North Dakota, which I had to add later, right? Because I just realized that needs not really a state. But North Dakota, another state high in Native American population. So there's your there's your story, there's your list. Thursday 13 states that got to need to get their act together. Maybe next week or a week later or a few weeks from now, we'll do these states with the highest voter participation. But back to you. All right. I also want to mention that Arizona also has a high native population, and the only way they were able to turn their state from red to blue was doing what? Mm -hmm. Actually having a voter drive where they, everyone got horses on whatever and they rode out from their, uh, their reservations to go put in their votes at the ballots last election. So that definitely needs to happen in all of these other states where they just have apathy, nihilism. Yeah, it's, they need to have it's voter worth drives. noting that uh worth noting that most of these states are not swing states like in the election the presidential election mm -hmm. so the the presidential campaigns spend no time there uh you'll never see a presidential campaigns waste time in louisiana or alabama because they're solidly red states because of the poor voter participation now if voter participation went up then presidential candidates would spend more time in your state no. Yep. Anyway, back to you. Okay. For our culture segment, we are going to read an editorial or I guess a newsletter from the Pushing Buttons newsletter by Keza McDonald on The Guardian. A few months ago, she wrote about a consulting agency, Sweet Baby Incorporated, that found itself at the center of a conspiracy theory. Agreed Gamers on Steam forum had erroneously concluded that this small agency was somehow mandating the inclusion of more diverse characters in games. Depressingly, but unsurprisingly, the result was a tremendous amount of targeted harassment towards the people who work at Sweet Baby and every journalist who reported on it, particularly the women who reported on it. It was a disturbing echo of Gamergate, an online harassment campaign 10 years ago that initially sprung from wild accusations of game developer's vindictive ex-boyfriend. The language has changed a bit in the past decade. They used to be upset about SJWs or social justice warriors and now they've taken issue with a different acronym, DEI, diversity, equality, and inclusion, or just old woke. But the sentiment from this group is the same. Games are for us, and for us only. If you want the games to change or tell stories outside the straightforward male-oriented power fantasies that we grew up with, then well, that's not allowed. We won't stand for it, in fact, we'll try to aggressively harass you out of the space entirely. Unfortunately, the anti-woke campaigning has not let up much in the intervening months. Led by a 
group of usual grifters that have taken issues with no particular order. The fact that Aphrodite, the literal goddess of the recent game tree of, or oh, sorry, the literal goddess of love, is not hot enough in Super Giants Hades 2. That female characters in recent game trailers all have square jaws and masculine bodies. That journalists gave the recent PS5 game Stellar Blade bad reviews because its female characters are too hot. Nope, they didn't. The game has a Metacritic score of 81. That too many games feature DEI haircuts. That's a fun one to interpret. And that Ubisoft was somehow forced by the shadowy force of Wokery to make the main character of its upcoming Assassin's Creed game black a black samurai there was actually a real black samurai in history it's a real thing he got off a boat in portugal i think a shogun bought him or something and then he became he became a samurai working under the shogun it's a real thing real thing that happened uh i like how people have to still justify it even if it yeah. didn't happen who cares <laughs> yeah it's a right? video game who gives a shit the last a, claim was bolstered by the right. king of bad posters himself, Elon Musk, who replied to the tweet about this manufactured outrage with DEI kills art. <laughs> Assassin's Creed Shadows executive producer. What is he? Yeah, he doesn't know anything about art. Mark Alexis Cote Nothing. addressed Musk's tweet in an interview with He's Game Files Stephen Totilio last week. It's just sad. He's just feeling feeding hatred. I had a Nothing lot of three word replies it. that came to mind, he said. The first thing I want to do was go back on Twitter that I had deleted and just tweet back. What Ellen says is not the game that we're building. People will have to play the game for themselves. And if within the first 11 and 47 seconds you're not convinced of what you're doing, we can have that discussion. For the record, there's plenty of historical basis for the depiction of Black Samurai in the Yasuke, Samurai Yasuke in the game. After Summer Game Fest finished, the anti-woke gamers found a new target, a report at IGN, which credibly and comprehensively lays out a history of sexism at the developer of upcoming Planet of the Apes meets Sekiro action game Black Myth, Wukong, the response, surprise, was to go after the woman who wrote it, while also spinning up a ludicrous conspiracy theory that IGN was blackmailing the developer. You can go down a rabbit hole of quite jaw-dropping horribleness on any one of these manufactured contro controversies, but take it from me, or take it from her, it's really not worth it. This reactionary under layer of gaming enthusiast media, which makes it mostly on Twitter and YouTube, does not actually have the slightest impact on how games are made, or indeed which games are made. Look at Gamergate. What did it actually achieve? Games are more diverse than they were 10 years ago, not less. Uh, she sees more non-white male faces and characters in this year's spate of Summer Games Fest trailers and demos than at any previous time in almost 20 years. She's been covering games. But they can still make people's online lives hell for a while. She knows this because she's been through it several times. I've seen it. I've never been through it, but I've seen it several times. She was running the UK branch of Kotaku when Gamergate, Brock, uh, Gamergate kicked off. And so, she had a front row seat for the harassment tactics, which include sending the most disgusting threats imaginable through all online channels available, trying to get her fired by emailing game publishers and bosses with dossiers of her professional misdeeds and journalistic failings, read, read as writing about video games from a feminist perspective. Oh my god, that's not a real journalism! Only one perspective matters, my <laughs> male-centric one! Searching for her colleagues, her friends and colleagues, real addresses and phone numbers and family members and posting those details on subreddits and putting together unhinged Google Docs with links drawn between SJW journalists and developers. One of these mad documents appeared briefly in a recent Netflix documentary about 4chan, prompting several of her friends to text her a screenshot asking if they knew that I was a figure in an old outright conspiracy theory. Unfortunately, she did know. It's happened again a few times since, for various re reasons. Unfortunately, dealing with online mobs is part of the job for many journalists and indeed game developers these days. Despite all the shit she's dealt with over the years as a woman covering video games, she's still rather glad she didn't write about politics. But I, she knows exactly how awful it can feel. Wait. She knows how awful it can feel when they mobilize against you, especially if it's the first time. 
They'll search for whatever they think is the least flattering image of you on Google Images, use it as a cutout for a YouTube thumbnail image, and then rant for 10 minutes over screenshots of your articles. They'll tweet prominent people in games trying to get them to publicly discredit you, to set their followers on you. It's hard not to meet their manufactured rage with a lot of genuine rage of your own. It's tempting to dunk on these people endlessly, but outrage feels outrage, especially now, when there's a literal money to be made posting inflammatory nonsense on Twitter or YouTube. If Gamergate proved anything, it's that nobody has to pander to rage-baiting toxic gamers, even or even listen to them. That said, she still doesn't think there's been enough public pushback against this flavor of online abuse from the biggest publishers and games over the past few months. When the consultancies they work with, the journalists and critics who cover them, and even some of their own developers have been caught in online shitstorm. Take it from her, vocal support means a lot. So, what have we learned here? I mean, it's not even just happening with video games, it's also happening with shows. Of course, there's a new Star Wars TV show coming out right now, and it's getting a lot of one-star reviews from counts that were just made yesterday, which is what you call review bombing. And why is that show getting uh -huh. review bombed? The main character is a black woman. <laughs> no, she's not allowed to exist. The only person who should ever oh, be a no. star of a Star Wars anything is a white man. Anything else is wokeism. <laughs> but uh, there's my culture segment on really don't listen to the guys, don't get baited by them, and don't even talk to them. The best way to fight a troll is to leave them alone. They want your attention. Okay, take, I'm a professional troll on the internet, as is Roger. And uh, the best thing you do is you keep commenting, keep commenting, that's it. And then people keep replying to you. And then you're like, well, we got it. We got them hooked, we got them hooked into this trolling. And uh, if they just stop replying, right. guess what you do as a troll? You move on with your life because, oh, I didn't bait them this time, darn. Anyways, there's your culture segment just, onto this day in history. It's a hobby. Mm -hmm. Of course, apartheid, Cly apartheid Clyde has to check in, right? Yeah. Elon Musk, because we all can't wait for this game. Why the hell we give a shit about his opinion? I don't know. Move out of life. So we get a rich, sheltered white guy's. Yeah. Dude. A guy doesn't even know what it's like to even be hungry for five seconds. Yeah. Look at the <laughs> life. He has not lived a life. Elon Musk is nothing, nothing that any of us are correct other than people. I companies, you're a moron. For an overrated, you know what you're talking about. You're just born rich with too much money. Mouth. And he uses uh, what is it? attention deficit disorder to justify what he asks. Ask. Okay, so this is history. You're tired of me talking. Mm -hmm. This day on June 20th, 1799, locked out of their meeting hall at Versailles, the deputies of the third estate of France congregated in, on a nearby tennis court not to separate until a written constitution had been established. The tennis court oath, the tennis court oath on this day in Versailles in France in 1789. 1837 with the death of William the Fourth, who I had to look up, I had the fourth, he was only, he was only, Victoria becomes queen of, in the during the world's most powerful for 10 children with his mistress. I look like that up. He had 10 children with his mistress, who was a comedian. Net our comedian is dead. That's an interesting little thing I'd like to read into. This day, British biochemist Frederick Lind Hopkins, who won a share of the 1929 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for his discovery of vitamins was born in Eastbourne, East Sussex. That's right, we didn't know what these were until 1929. This guy named them, Frederick Gowland Hopkins. Why aren't they called Hopkinses? Is this? We should name it after him, we would be more famous. 1887, he'd be like James Watt, right? We named the Watt after him. Yeah. The unit of power. 
1887 or what's his name volta he named volts after him german dada artist and poet kurt schwitters in 1887 was born in hanover he was best known for his collages and relief construction his collages on this day in 1893 following a tried trial that was a national sensation in the United States, Lizzie Borden was acquitted for murdering, murdering her father and stepmother. Did she do it? We don't know. She was acquitted. 1903, American automobile racing driver Barney Oldfield accomplished the first, a first, the mile a minute performance in a car at Indianapolis, Indiana, which is basically 60 miles an hour. Doesn't seem that great, but I'm sure it's averaged over several hours. 1905, American playwright and screenwriter Lillian Hellman was born in New Orleans. Her, her dramas forcefully attack injustice, exploitation, and self selfishness. Lillian Hellman, born in 1905. Also born on this day, on 1928, American jazz musician Eric Dolphy, a virtuoso improviser with, on woodwinds and a major influence on free jazz, was born in Los Angeles. Uh, another birthday today, Australian actress Nicole Kidman was born on this day. We jumped way ahead to 1967 for the Australian glamorous actress known for her glamorous looks and cool demeanor. She was born in Hawaii. She's an Australian actress, but born in Hawaii. 1975, Steven Spielberg's thriller Jaws was released in theaters, and it was a huge success, essentially creating the genre of summer blockbusters. And Steven Spielberg probably just rocketed into superstardom with that movie. 1992, a new constitution went into effect in Paraguay, signaling the end of military rule established in the 1950s by Alfredo Stosner. Alfredo Stosner. 2002, and this day, in Atkins versus Virginia, the Supreme Court ruled that imposition of the death penalty in cases involving intellectually disabled defendants violated the Eighth Amendment's protection against cruel and unusual punishment. That kills anybody else's intellect and disabled anyway. You, just, you don't have a normal level. Just, mm -hmm. Like, oh, well, so I get to kill people. But they exist all the time anyway. Our featured event in 1567, casket letters found. The casket letters, which directly implicated Mary, Queen of Scots, in a plot with James Hepburn, 4th Earl of Bothwell, to murder Mary's husband, Henry Stewart, the Lord Darnley, were said to have been discovered on this day in 1567. Ooh, we got these letters. And then they executed Mary Queen of Scots. Locked her up. In a, she might have been locked up in the Tower of London already by Queen Elizabeth. First. Or not the Tower of London. One of the mother towers. There's Yeah, there's plenty of towers around there. there. And plenty of prisons. Most, most, of, uh, most of those castles have a place to lock people up. They do. Our feature biography is Howlin' Wolf, American musician. Howlin' Wolf, born June 20th, 1910 in West Point, Mississippi. He died on January 10th, 1976 in Hines, Illinois at the age of 65. So happy birthday to Howlin' Wolf, who played at the, who played at the Newport uh, Folk Festival with his electric guitar and nobody booed. <laughs> Hollow Wolf, again, imitated by so many white uh, rock and roll singers. Really? Um, yeah. 1925? Yeah, oh yeah. Should have played some Holland Wolf. Audie Murphy was born on this day, 1925, American war hero and actor who died in a, I think he died in a car accident. 1949, the birthday of Lionel Richie, American songwriter and singer and producer. Also, the birthday of John Goodman, who you know, who was on, you know, famous American actor Walter and the Big Lebowski. Happy birthday, Walter! And 1953 is the birthday of Cindy Lauper. Happy birthday to Cindy Lauper. Girls just want to have fun. American singer and songwriter, 
And of course, we already covered Nicole Kidman. And what day is it today? It's a whole slew of days today. It's National Vanilla Milkshake Day. That's important. It's National American Eagle Day. The worst milkshake flavor. Vanilla. Really? Basic. Sure. What's, well, yeah, but you can add stuff to it. I, I hear you. I hear you. Vanilla is still the most popular ice cream. No, it's because it's easier to... I think it's just easier to mix with stuff. It's a base flavor, so you can add to it. It doesn't subtract from the flavor. It's Ann and Samantha Day. Uh, oh, boy. And Samantha Day, I had to click on that one. We did this last year about Anne Frank. Yeah. And Samantha, Samantha, Anne Frank. Oh, Anne Frank, she would hold up in Amsterdam, being uh, mm -hmm. family until the Nazis discovered her and threw her in a can. Yeah, we know who she is. And of course, Samantha is, uh, let's see, Samantha Smith is different, totally different situation. Um, are they going to tell me? Samantha Smith. Da, 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 da. Um, you wrote a letter to the Soviet Samantha Union. Samantha Smith, them to daughter. Please stop cold warring. Ah, she's one of her. Ah, there you go. There. So it's, about, it's basically it about a, young like, girls way to the who of the page you mentioned. kind of took up a leadership position, even though they're like children, I guess. People who should have to be asking, their, asking for right? humanity to be humanity. They're more than just precocious little children. They were thoughtful. Yeah. National, here's another one we got to look up. National Kuning Aman Day. It looks like a pastry. Maybe you can look that up. You got the same page I do. Kudig, K-U-A-O-U-A-O-U-I-G-N. Come on. Do you know how to pronounce that? Does it say how to pronounce that? It's also National Ice Cream Soda Day. So it's Vanilla Milkshake Day. Ice Cream Soda Day. Man, if you don't weigh 400 pounds by the end of the day. It's National Seashell Day also. You can't eat those. It's National Hike with a Geek Day. Hike with a Geek Day. What is this? <laughs> really, um... <laughs> You're going to have to insult one of your friends to go on a hike today. Summer begins. This is the longest day of the year. Summer solstice today. So get out there and enjoy it. You can tell the earth's going to hit the brakes and start tilting back the other way. That happens today. You feel it. At some point today, the earth's going to stop on a dime and start going back the other way. So that's how it actually happened. Do you feel it? I don't know. Do we actually feel it? I think maybe we do. I think I think the water in our brain shifts the other direction. I think that's actually. Don't <laughs> that more water in our brain. Yeah. <laughs> so there's just there's your stories for today, your days for today, your news for today. We still haven't figured out what that pastry is. It looks like a pastry. You can't pronounce it. So those are your stories. June 20th, 2024 on the floor ice cream soda. Ice cream soda. All right, this has been Allison here from the Netherlands. The sun is shining, but it's not a heat wave. I hope everyone out there who is in the heat wave drinks water, stays inside as much as possible. And if you can't stay inside as much as possible, please make sure to take breaks. And if your head starts hurting, get into the shade, get some cold, splash yourself in with some water and cool down. We will see you tomorrow for the Friday news dump where we're gonna cover everything before the weekend. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so you know when we go live and when we post a video. And here is our mic drop moment. And one very exciting area of folk idiom and folk music to us has always been the hatchet murders in Massachusetts. And Lizzie Borden song. <laughs> And I think that this quaint bit of suburban living uh, can, 
can best be explained through the use of our poet laureate, Joe Frazier. Rather. Elizabeth Borden George took Ford. an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. <laughs> and when the job was nicely done, she gave her father 41. <laughs> An old Paul Ripper, Mr. Andrew Borden, died And he got his daughter Lizzie on a charge of homicide Some folks say she didn't do it And others say, of course she did but They all yeah. agree Miss Lizzie B was a problem kind of kid Cause you can't chop your papa up in Massachusetts Not even if it's planned as a surprise A surprise! So you can't <laughs> chop your papa up in Massachusetts Not allowed. You're not allowed to do it. <laughs> Gone to take a snooze, and I hope he went to heaven because he wasn't wearing shoes. Oh. He, kinda rearranged he wasn't wearing it, shoes. Uh -huh. so they say. Then she got her mother in that same old fashioned way. But you can't chop your mama up in Massachusetts. Not even if you're tired of her cuisine. Her cuisine. No, you can't chop your mama <laughs> up cuisine. in Massachusetts. To you know it's almost sure to cause a scene. Well, they really kept her hopping on that busy afternoon With both down and upstairs chopping while she hummed a ragtime tune They really made her hustle and when all was said and done she removed her mother's bustle People say old, like the old songs that have to you know. her mama up in Massachusetts And then blame all the damage on the mice So you can't chop your mama up in Massachusetts That kind of thing just isn't very nice now it wasn't done for pleasure. You gotta it wasn't done for spite. Appreciate and the graveyard humor. Because of the lady wasn't very really yeah. slight. She'd always done the slightest thing that mom and papa did. They said, "Lizzie, cut it out." So that's exactly what she did. Bruce and Bruce and Sam. Cut it out. So that's exactly what she did. Your papa up in Massachusetts. Can't chop your mama up in Massachusetts. Can't chop your papa up in Massachusetts. Here comes Lizzie with a brand new hatchet. <laughs> There's your Lib Lizzie Borden. Politically incorrect. Sorry. Yeah. Jump like a porpoise. Oh, hands and hey, the shock ball. Right. Are we off the air? Yep, we're still there. It's, it's the doing the applause. Woo! <laughs> I don't know if we're synced up. I started it about 30 seconds. So. Yeah, it's, that's fine. I just put the whole thing in, honestly. Oh, okay. There's nothing at the beginning. The first 30 seconds is an indecipherable noise, as far as I can tell. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.